Well, you know, I focus on black entrepreneurs because I'm an African American and I've experienced what it's like to live in this skin in this country. And um, it can be applied in any context, but the context for entrepreneurship for me is, is that uh, I would say that in a capitalist construct, which I think is not the best way we could uh, organize resources, but in that construct here in America, ownership is the last stop on the Underground Railroad for those who have been owned. We believe that anyone, anywhere can make startups. After spending more than a decade building our own company, we've learned a ton. We've mentored founders and built startup communities. We've helped craft government policies, and we've also invested in businesses, some that succeeded and some that didn't. We've helped thousands of startup founders, funders, and facilitators. We're inspired by their dreams and determination. Our goal is to travel across America and meet as many as we can, tell their story, and share their lessons. We're on a mission to help you succeed, to show you that you aren't crazy you aren't alone. You really can do this. We're here to make startups together. Uh, so my name is Paolo Gregory. I uh, am the founder of Cohado. In about 2016, I met Mike Binko, who uh, proceeded to tell me I was an ecosystem builder. So I don't know when I started ecosystem building. I think it's been really um, forever in my career in different ways. I've always worked around collaboration and supporting uh, micro systems to macro systems, collective impact uh, systems to function uh, in a collaborative way. So I don't know. I was named an ecosystem builder. How do you feel about that name? I see a lot of folks using the word ecosystem building, and a lot of the time, um, I think it's kind of thrown around. I would actually prefer to be uh, known as a community builder. We've had a lot of interesting conversations over the years, um, where I think we've pushed back and forth on, on some, some ways of talking about the work that we do, even though I think that in a lot of ways we're similar in how we think about it. We'll figure out more over time, right? Um, there's a unique framing that you like to present to the world of sort of how we all interact with one another and maybe what a better paradigm for that interaction should be. I'm wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, I would say um, that the world having been overtly designed by mostly men, that uh, there's a very masculine sort of hierarchical dominant paradigm that seems to be everywhere. Uh, it's omnipresent. And in the background has been the work that I see is really critical, particularly now, which is the, um, the caring for, holding, supporting, and growing community, which has largely been what the women have done for cultures for millennia. And uh, it has gone fairly unrecognized under this dominant mantle, but you see the same architecture of that community orientation in virtually every indigenous culture. Uh, you see it very present in the black culture here in the United States and elsewhere in Africa, lots of different places. But that has been pushed down because the goal of the dominant culture is to win by appearing or feeling or looking better than other folks 
versus the goal being we lift everyone. And so um, I would say that's the old architecture I think needs to evolve to really um, honor those cultures, including the culture of women, the culture of uh, indigenous folks to be lifted up so that it is balancing uh, and balanced in the recognition of what it takes to really survive and thrive as humans. And it's interesting, so you have developed Kahato as a way to help people understand what that would be. And I'm really curious when the, you know, do you remember that moment when, I think I know how to convey this, came to you and, and how you were able to then bring it about? Yeah, so, um, we teach operating systems to our young people through the use of games. And so the games are very telling. If you look at the games any culture plays, and every culture has games, and the way they're constructed, you can learn a lot about the structure of the operating system that's underlying it. And um, Kohato, uh, I hadn't intended to create a game. I happened to be playing dominoes with a friend, and uh, it was a, a very intense, um, struggling, competitive space, and I've been in that domino space many times. And I realized that, uh, that that space feels like my life in a lot of ways feeling that I'm forced to compete and folks are competing against me for resources, for attention, for all kinds of things. And I hate that. I hate that space. And so I was playing dominoes and I just put the pieces down and said, this game is keeping us in this destructive relationship and we need a new game. And literally that was the moment that I started figuring out what Kohato was. What do you think the world would be like if we adopted this new architecture? Um, I think we wouldn't need to be sitting on chairs because we would be floating on devices that support us. I think that, uh, you know, if you look at the amount of dollars that are spent to build weapons of destruction, across the planet and how how that destruction is is just pressed on folks particularly now we see it um, in the Middle East and we see it in Africa and we see it in East Baltimore that if you could eliminate that destructive uh, element then all those resources could be used to transform the global humanity into something that actually works, supports, promotes life, promotes innovation, promotes um, just, the, I, can't, I can't imagine what the world could be uh, with those resources aimed in a way. But I know that um, if uh, the US military wants to wage war, they could build a city in three days to do that. What if we built cities to support people in those short periods of time with, uh, with a balance with nature where everything is sustainable and we are a plus some presence on the planet rather than uh, a minus some of presence? Yeah, um, I'm, only, I'm gonna ask one more and I wanna get the floor to you ask, to ask some, but I, there's a little bit of a difference between talking about this as this overall architecture of society and now I think how you're applying it in the world of entrepreneurship and capital, but can you speak to the role of entrepreneurship and capital in helping bring about this new system? Well, you know, I focus on black entrepreneurs because I'm an African American and I've experienced what it's like to live in this skin in this country. And um, it can be applied in any context, but the context for entrepreneurship 
for me is, is that uh, I would say that in a capitalist construct, which I think is not the best way we could uh, organize resources, but in that construct here in America, ownership is the last stop on the Underground Railroad for those who have been owned. So we're, we're, we're interviewing you also because you're in Baltimore and we wanted to talk with you about the all Baltimore entrepreneur ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so I was curious, would you tell us, you know, what, what, are, the, what are your favorite things about Baltimore in terms of the, the work that you do in that community? Well, um, I've worked with young people in lots of different ways in job training and in entrepreneurship uh, development in work bridging between police and the youth in Baltimore. And most recently that work has been working with adults who are entrepreneurs. And outside of when I was a preschool teacher, teaching three and four years old, three and four year olds, this is the most delightful work I have done. Um, the entrepreneurs that we work with are all black entrepreneurs and they're 85 to 90 percent women not because we've chosen that but that's who has walked into the space that we've created and it is um it is like coming home uh, it is like being in a place where folks genuinely love and respect each other genuinely want to see all of each other thrive um, and it's just, it's just this level of community and reciprocity and love that is, it's hard to explain unless you sit within it. But if you're sitting within it, it feels like that vision, uh, the seed for the vision of the world that I would like to see come about. So, the, um, so one of the things I know that um, I like to share with people is that our work with the Startup Champions Network is, is a direct byproduct of your invitation to me during Nisha. That we met on the last day at the last hour and you didn't know me from Adam. And as you got to know me, you invited me into this community. And I'll never forget the idea that like, I'm your sister. And you're like, we need more sisters in this space. And so I think that um, knowing that this, this organization has blossomed and I give you a lot of credit for that the, the, the leadership that you provide for it I'm curious like how do you see now the the network of ecosystem builders growing not just in in, in, in this area but maybe like across the country um, yes my invitation was because I felt uh, the strength of your spirit and and I could see that you were somebody who was getting things done and you are a woman. And at that point in time, uh, was that the first e-ship? I think it was in 2018. Okay, second e-ship. Mm -hmm. um, so at that time, uh, the Startup Champions Network uh, was struggling to grow beyond its kind of root foundation as predominantly men, predominantly white men, predominantly folks in tech, predominant focus on high growth. And to me, that individualistic paradigm was very present in SCN. And to me, like when we were, when we had new, had summits back then, we'd ask folks what their experience was. And we got a lot of feedback that said, well, I felt like an outsider. I felt like there were these cliques that I wasn't a part of. And so I just didn't feel like I belonged in the space, which was very painful to me. And so I think um, that through some really uh, strong attention focused on changing that, that the space has become one when we get the feedback now where folks said, 
I finally found my family. People understand who I am. I felt like I belonged the moment I walked in the door. And that kind of transformation is exactly the kind of transformation that is a model for the work, all of the work that I do. Um, it's a seed that gets planted here, which then can then sprout in all of these, you know, virtually 50 states in this country uh, to begin to grow communities of belonging where uh, anyone is welcome and anyone is embraced as they come in. One of the things that has been my most favorite parts of SCN, and you're the person that leads the session every time we get together, so I just credit you with all of it, and I'm sure there's other people involved, but the, the framing of the conversation around intercultural unity, to me, was an absolute game changer in allowing people that look like me to participate in a conversation where they might have felt defensive about the conversation before. And do you remember, you know, how the organization and you or like what 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 precipitated that shift in, in how to bring about the conversation? Um well there was a uh, summit in Fargo, North Dakota that uh, was one of the two summits that I have not attended, so I wasn't there. Um, but apparently some uh, issues around diversity and inclusivity blew up in Fargo. Uh, and in that moment, um, there was some facilitation that happened that did not solve the challenge. Um, the next summit was in Chattanooga, and so the organization realized it had to address this. So they brought in a facilitator to help with the conversation, um, which uh, opened the door to the conversation. Um, following that conversation, still in Chattanooga, uh, we got into small groups to discuss whatever anyone wanted to discuss. And a group of us got together to look at this, um, to look at this challenge that they were facing around uh, difference and dominance in, in the space. And I've been the facilitator of that work my entire life. And so I sat in and I was asked to actually facilitate this small conversation. And what, the small group said was, let's approach this as if we are starting a business and let's create a prototype using SCN as the minimum viable product to show how you can move a culture from one of tension and division to one of belonging and, and inclusivity. And that's when the, uh, the term ICU came up, uh, which is a play on words, meaning I see you, which is the first thing you need to do in any uh, situation where you're trying to build community is you have to actually see the people you're with and you also have to be present. Um, and that derives from the South African greeting, which is Saupona which literally means I see you. And Sakona is the response, which is I am here. Um, there's also another response, which is Sakona Noma Sengeko, which means I am here, but part of my spirit is missing. And if someone says that to you, Ubuntu, the philosophy that says we are responsible for each other's well-being, requires you to stay with that person until their spirit is regained, whether that's five minutes or the rest of your life. And so I think that SCN was in a Sakona Noma Sengeko moment 
And I think the planet is in this Sakona, no, Noma Sengeko moment. And so we as ecosystem builders need to take up our responsibility to say, we're gonna stay and we're gonna stay working on this until the spirit is regained. Um, and I, I think that responsibility uh, whether we know it or not, is present in each of the sub-ecosystems. How do we create places where folks can access capital, where folks can access support that traditionally are blocked and barred from those spaces? And so how do we bring that, that work? And I think there have been a lot of people that helped in this process, and most of them were women, interestingly enough, that joined the ICU a team, et cetera, because they get it. And I think that we're all a little tired of being in spaces that don't feel like that. So, so one of the things that, um, you know, when we, when we talk about entrepreneurship and we talk about, um, you know, the idea that someone is, is not only creating a job for themselves, they're creating a job in their community. And, and, and we'd like to think that, regardless of whether it's a Main Street job, a Wall Street job, a, 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 a side hustle versus a tech job that's scalable, like, the, the, the things that entrepreneurs need at the end of the day is, is a combination of a lot of the things you talk about, whether it's a, a social capital, you know, the, the community, right? Whether it's your friends and family, whether it's your investors, potential customers, and then there's the financial capital. And the financial capital is, is, is limiting, it's fleeting, it's not something that, that we're all being able to access. And so one of the things that we talk about is, is sort of the, the economic injustices that exist for entrepreneurs. and We'd like to think that if, if there was an opportunity to say that there was money coming in with you and your community and your organization, you know, how could that transform some of the entrepreneurs in your city? As opposed to, is, is it an investment? Is it a grant? Is it a customer? What what kind of what kind of financial capital could really transform your community and, and change the, 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 the trajectory of some of your founders? Um, I would say it's at two levels. Um, the first level is the work of convening, of bringing folks together, is uh, often invisible if it's done really well. Um, the conveners are not the ones running in front of the cameras. They're the ones that are behind the scenes stewarding work, not leading work. And I think there needs to be sustainable funding for that process and role of stewardship in each of these uh, <laughs> ecosystems. And it's just not present in any scale. And it's easier for some folks to access because of the relationships, uh, connections they have than others. Um, we've been blessed to have, you know, four years of, uh, of what we would call chicken bone funding, you know, enough to keep it going. Mm -hmm. Um, but that funding is drying up because there's no, um, there's no real recognition of how critical this work is. Um, so I think that's the base that needs to be there to, to hold the fabric, right? Well, it's, 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 it's sort of like the safety net, right? right? To keep the people coming together on a consistent basis. Um, there's a term that I heard recently that's said that it's really hard to hunt and garden at the same time. Exactly. So if you're hunting for money, you can't garden your community at the same time. Exactly. And you really want to garden your community. Right, absolutely. I think that's a good metaphor. And if you're hunting for money, right. that is one of the Tough. least favorite things I mm -hmm. uh, have to do. Um, and then the secondary is the capital for supporting the stabilization and growth of these businesses, which, um, which, you know, uh, we we've had conversations of looking to create like a hundred million dollar uh, social equity fund mm -hmm. that uh, that would be there to support entrepreneurs, but also would be regenerative, mm -hmm. so that that pool, that well, as we say in Cohado, would remain full enough so that it could grow and then the entrepreneurs would feed back into the well as they as they gain capacity 
And so I, th I think, you know, a city like Baltimore, that's, you know, that's kind of a baseline of kind of resources that are needed. And it's hard to pull those resources. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not my expertise. There's some folks who really understand that work. Um, and so. But we also know that like, you know, working in it, 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 grassroots, boots on the ground in the community, a lot of our founders don't need that much money to keep themselves going. They need a little bit of capital. They need the credit. They need, you know, favorable terms for things. And that could be something as small as like 10 or $15,000. And then you sort of can be able to build on that. Like you said, maybe create like an evergreen fund where they pay, pay back into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's like, most of the folks that we work with are um, what we would call community-based, ground-level lifestyle businesses mm -hmm. that are not going to scale 50x and deliver some right. some payout. And we actually uh, we actually look at the entrepreneurs as the seed the seed growth for the communities. Mm -hmm. So when they and our communities have been devastated in terms of you know pre. Uh, desegregation the communities had lawyers and shoemakers and cleaners and barber shops and like all the things you need in a community to grow and the dollars would move in the community now all of that has been um, stripped away from these communities so part of it it's like there's a desert there there and so we're trying to reseed and water the desert with businesses that could then start that recirculation process and you know ten or fifteen thousand dollars can can help a business um, but it's also the community of businesses that need to be supported so you can grow community and that's where the scaling of the funding happens and you know there's a lot if you're a small business uh, in that kind of environment Loans can kill your business, mm -hmm. right? You you get a loan from a bank, you think great, you know, you got this fifty thousand dollars or whatever, and you're you're paying it back monthly, and you have this the same nut to pay every month, but your income is doing this. So not every month do you have the same capacity to pay. So those those things can directly kill a business as well as as providing support for it. So, you know, looking at new models that we've heard about through places like Right to Start, mm -hmm. et cetera, where, uh, where it's like a profit-based uh, model of payback. So when your profit has a, has a low month, then you pay less on that. When you have a great month, you pay more so that the, so that the tools of support are actually flowing with you, not against yeah. you. Yeah, the flexibility sounds like it could be a solution. Is um, sometimes I always feel like I'm just like extracting more and more knowledge from from you, but um, I'm gonna ask one more. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you hope that other communities could learn from the Black Butter Fund? So I th I would say it really I would say they can learn how powerful. Um, community building is uh, that if you talk to or when you talk to uh, some of our business owners they'll say that this network has been responsible for them staying in business without capital right and it's not that the capital isn't necessary but the community is critical when you're going through a challenging time in your business. And a lot of small business owners, most, most support for small businesses views them as individual founders and it views them in, in competition with each other. We always hear pitch competition, pitch competition, pitch competition. Why do we have pitch competition? I don't get it. Like, why are we getting folks to compete over small pieces of resources rather than connecting them to grow, exponentially grow the capacity of the resources that are available? And so, 
I would say that the, the learning of the butterfly is that um, we did research in advance of starting this project with Forward Cities and Faye Horowitz, and the research showed that 80% of Baltimore-based black businesses fold within 18 months. And in our cohort of now about 60 businesses, only one of the 60 has not sustained. So we're at like a 98% retention rate, which is totally inverse of the trend. You know, and it, you can't, I can't say that the butterfly is the sole reason for that, but you know, the people who came into the butterfly were probably um, more open to this kind of connectivity than, than others. Um, but it, it made a difference. And, you know, and we've heard that in interviewing our founders, we've heard that over and over again, that this is the place where I go when things are challenging. Um, as you're an individual business owner, you go for three kind of up and down cycles. And that fourth one, you're like, I'm tired. I can't do this again. I'm done. But if you have a community of folks who have been through those things that say, just hang in here. You know, I was in that place last year. And just, you know, here's some things I did. And here's how I got past it then you don't feel that sense of aloneness because you know we all know entrepreneurs their parents families don't understand what they're doing or why they're doing it why don't you just get a job and have a steady income and health insurance etc so you don't have these natural supports that that uh unless that space is created for you so i would say well in, in the hopes that there is a give back in there exchange, um, mutual exchange. Should someone watch this video, how can they help? Send us cash. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, I would say... If they to, want more information about you, your, you know, the work that you're doing, Butterfly Group. Um, so you can go to our web page, which is network and you can see where all the resources that we've put in, how they've been utilized. You can see events we've put on, et cetera. And you can also connect to our eco map through that, which is the same first half, but exchange, dot exchange. Um, but you can bridge through that, that site too. Um, and, you know, there are also places to sponsor places to donate, places to support, and places to join the network on that site. Um, you know, it would be phenomenal if the resources um, could come in a way that's not so hunty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That the, the, the rain comes to water the garden. Exactly, without, without strings attached. Without strings. Mm -hmm.